There is a, a passage of scripture that used to be, uh, I remember seeing it on a banner in the entryway of a church a few years ago that I just, I love the passage of scripture because it reminds me how we ought to enter the Lord's presence. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord and worship. And I hope that you are glad this morning. I hope that you came here this morning with a desire to, to fellowship with other people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy time looking into his word together and being encouraged by that. On the other side of things, you may have come in here this morning just exhausted. You might be feeling discouraged. And I pray that this morning then is, is a time where you might find encouragement, that you might find the presence of the Lord and experience his love for you. So let's take a moment, let's pray and thank the Lord for his presence with us this morning. God, there is a, a great deal of encouragement that comes from the knowledge that you promise that you're present. You, you didn't create things and then just stay off at a distance. You are intimately involved in your creation. So much so that you sent your son to be born as as a boy and to, to live and to die for our sins and to be resurrected and to intercede for us constantly before your throne. You promise, Lord, that all who have put their faith in you for forgiveness and salvation, that you are with us no matter where we are. It's not that we <coughs> gather here this morning so that we can be with you. You're with us. And so I thank you for that. I thank you for each one of these folks, Lord, and this time that we get to enjoy together that we have this opportunity to rejoice in the God of our salvation. So I pray, Lord, for our time of singing your praises. I pray for our time in your word and the fellowship that follows. God, may it be that which encourages us, draws us deeper in our relationship with you, and may it be to your honor and glory, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's stand together, and we're going to open our time in song inviting the Lord to build his kingdom right here among us. Build your kingdom here. Come see your rule and reign our hearts again. In peace in us we pray. Unveil oh my reign. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like God by rain.
we look forward to the Lord's return. As believers, we look forward to the promise that He's coming back, that He will take us to be with Him forever. And yet, He's building His kingdom right here, right now, in His people, in His church with a capital C. As those who have put their faith in Christ for salvation, we are the ones that are showing to the world that, that light, that salt that God calls us to show. We are the ones who hold forth God's truth. We are God's plan for reaching the world with the truth of His love, His offer of forgiveness and salvation. And we want everyone to know that that is only available through faith in Jesus Christ. Our salvation, our forgiveness, our hope for an eternal future is all because of Jesus. That's our next song, All Because of Jesus. every reason 
to give God praise, to thank our Lord for His willing sacrifice for us that we might be offered forgiveness and eternal life through faith in Christ. You know, that, that comes not because we deserve it, not because we earn it in any way. It's because of God's amazing grace. And we're going to close with amazing grace. My chains are gone. Adults, you may sit down. Kids, you may head for the back doors. And Kids Connection will be getting started upstairs, so follow your teacher on upstairs. Just a couple of quick things that I would like to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, number one, if you have uh, volunteered 
here at the church with any of our kids that are under the age of 18, so you've worked with our youth in any way, uh, Kids Connection, VBS, any of the things that we've done, uh, it is likely time for you to renew your mandated reporter training. Uh, those who have served the church as volunteers in those capacities uh, in the past few years, you should have received an email from the church this week with links and information on how to go about renewing your mandated reporter training and child abuse awareness training. Uh, also, if you have yet to be live scanned, we do a background check, a live scan, and uh, the child abuse awareness and mandated reporter training for all of our volunteers that serve with the kids here at the church. So if you have not yet been live scanned, uh, this is something that's relatively new in the last year or so. So if you haven't done that, there should be a link in the email that you received as well. There's a form that you can just print out and take right up to the UPS store. They do live scans up there. Uh, the church is covering the cost of that if you take it right up to the UPS store here. So just fill out that form, go up there, get your live scan done, and uh, we'll receive the results here. So uh, if you have volunteered with kids in the past, if you are thinking about volunteering with kids here in the future, uh, if, if you didn't get the email, talk to me, talk to Julia after the service. We'll be sure to get you that information. And uh, particularly with VBS coming up, I do want to note that we have changed the dates. We were looking at a June date and found that there was a conflict there. So the dates we are now looking at for our VBS program that we're going to run this summer will be July 15th through the 18th. It will be uh, an evening program, so that allows for any of our folks who maybe are, are working during the day to be able to come and help. We've got all sorts of help that will be needed. We need people to serve as teachers and leaders. We need people to corral kids. We need people to be part of the skits. We need people to help out with crafts and snacks and playing games. So there are plenty of opportunities to help with that. Uh, Tammy Longus is the one who is coordinating that for us yet again. So right now we're just putting out the dates so that you can get that on your calendar. If you have more questions, talk to Tammy, and as things get closer, we'll have more information about what specific needs there are. But I uh, encourage you to help out with that if you can, if you have that time available. It is a lot of fun working with those kids and just sharing the love of God with them. Those are the things that are coming up. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me now, and let's pray as we look to God's Word together. God, you're real. I know there's so much in our world that, that doubts your existence, but all we have to do is step out of these doors and look at the splendor of your creation and recognize your hand in it. We see your handiwork in the stars. We see it in how you have made this world. And even though, Lord, this, this world is groaning under the weight of sin, we still, still see evidence of the beauty of your creation. And we thank you for it. Lord, to know that you are not only our creator and, and sovereign king, but you desire to be our father and our friend by faith in Christ. Lord, I thank you for your word, that we don't have to guess what it is that you want or, or try and figure out the best we can what we might need to do in order to, to find a relationship with you and be saved. You've spelled it out for us. It's right here in our hands. So thank you for that blessing as well. We ask your leading and guidance as we look to your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever seen or experienced someone who was pretending to be someone they're not? I, I'm not talking about like kids or even adults dressing up, uh, you know, for a costume party and just, you know, pretending to be something. I'm not even talking about actors who inhabit a role on the stage or, or TV or film. I'm talking about someone who appears to be and sounds to be something that it turns out to be they're actually not. Maybe, maybe it's the way they dress, maybe it's the car they're driving, maybe it's the career they claim to have or the background that they supposedly come from. Someone who is trying to appear to be something, but when you dig a little deeper, you find out, well, they're, they're not actually that thing. An example of this might be something like uh, Stolen Valor. If you are familiar with that, Stolen Valor is when someone takes on a military persona. They maybe dress in the uniform, maybe they find their way into purchasing some military medals and, and insignia, and they, they try to pass themselves off as someone who has served in our military. 
Uh, almost two weeks ago up in Reading where our daughter Amy lives, police arrested a man who was in a military uniform, which, which actually wasn't even a really good example because he had bits of Navy, he had bits of Army, he had insignias from both different branches of the military, and he kind of just kind of molded it all together. But he was, he was running this scheme to swindle people out of money, and he did it all the way up and down the I-5 corridor. They finally caught up with him in Reading. He was going into businesses and showing them a, a, a 20-year-old picture of his disabled son and asking them to give in support of his disabled son. And when officers got hold of him, he had thousands of dollars in cash and $5,000 in jewelry he had just lifted off of another store. And all the while claiming that, well, you know, I'm in the military and I just, I, I need help supporting my son. And I don't know what it is that compels people to do something like that. I, I don't know what it is that compels people to, to dress up as somebody who has served in our military and, and try and pass themselves off as if they actually did, trying to appear to be something they're not. I suppose it could be they, maybe they want to be honored, maybe they want to be admired, uh, maybe their greed, like in this case, maybe their greed motivates them to seek financial benefits from others, benefits they certainly haven't earned. Maybe, maybe it goes deeper than that. Maybe they've truly deceived themselves into believing that somehow it's okay. And in some cases, it, it can be hard to tell what's genuine and what is not. That's equally true when it comes to people of faith. What makes a believer? How do you know someone truly believes in God? How do you know you truly believe in God? I think there are plenty of imposters out there, let's say. Some may be trying to deceive people into thinking they're something they're not. Others may just mistakenly believe, mistakenly think they are okay with God when maybe they're not. So what makes a believer? That's, that's an important question because it has eternal significance, eternal consequences if you're wrong. As we make our way this morning into the fourth chapter of Daniel we see this pagan king we've seen through the first three chapters. We see King Nebuchadnezzar giving praise to God for everything that God has done. So are we to understand by that that Nebuchadnezzar finally now believes in the one true God? Maybe. But, but I have my doubts. I'm still not sure that he has come to that point of recognizing that the one true God is the only God. There's four things which we can draw out of the opening verses of Daniel chapter 4. Four things which might indicate that Nebuchadnezzar is a believer in God. But those same four things by themselves don't make a person a believer. They, they may indicate that a person's a believer, but by themselves, that's not what it means to be a believer. There's got to be something more. So Nebuchadnezzar certainly talks the talk in the verses that we're going to look at. The first point that we'll make, though, is that using religious language does not a believer make. Using religious language does not a believer make. It's more than just having the right words. It's no, more than just knowing the lingo. Secondly, the king acknowledges God's miraculous activity in his life, but the second point is that experiencing a miracle does not a believer make. Experiencing a miracle does not a believer make. God doesn't do the amazing things that He does simply for our entertainment. He does those things to draw us to Himself. Now, it's, it's clear that Nebuchadnezzar was moved by God and what He had done, but the third thing that we'll need to understand here is that being impressed by God and His actions does not a believer make. 
just to say, you know what, God is really impressive and the things He does. Being impressed by God and His actions does not a believer make. And finally, it's not enough even to have believing friends or, or relatives or, or to, to have a church that you go to. Knowing true believers does not a believer make. That's the fourth thing. Knowing true believers does not a believer make. So we're going to touch on those four things as we look at the opening verses of Daniel 4. And after we look at those four things, we'll finish up by seeking the right answer to what makes a believer. And, and what we find is the answer is actually pretty simple. So open your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 4 or, or turn on your tablets or phones there, whatever you're using. Make your way to Daniel chapter 4. Uh, you'll find it past the Psalms or right about the middle of your Bible there, and you get into uh, a couple of the, the larger prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations and then Ezekiel, and right after Ezekiel comes the smaller book of Daniel, 12 chapters. We are in Daniel chapter 4. I want you to follow along as I read the first nine verses for us so that we have it all right here in front of us. So Daniel chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, we read... Nebuchadnezzar, the king, to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are His signs, and how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions in my, visions in my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. But finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen along with its interpretation. So was Nebuchadnezzar a believer? What makes a believer? I'll tell you what doesn't. Using religious language does not a believer make. You know, certain environments, uh, certain jobs, they have their own language, right? If you were to walk into an auto repair shop, there are terms the mechanics will throw back and forth with each other to describe parts or problems with cars. And unless you know something about cars or the problems they can have, it might as well be a foreign language, right? And, and I know I've, I've heard some mechanics, you know, have a little fun with that. And, you know, they know somebody doesn't know anything about cars, so they just start making up words to see what the person knows and doesn't know. Same is true in hospitals. Not, not that they make up words, but, but that they have equipment and procedures and diseases that have names, sometimes very technical names. And there, there are terms associated with treatments and all of these different things, terms which will completely confuse anyone who is unfamiliar with them, anyone who does not routinely operate in that medical field. Now, if you hear someone casually using those terms from, from either of those fields, you likely assume that they probably know what they're talking about because they're using that kind of technical language. They are using those terms that we would associate with somebody who obviously works on cars or works with people. But is that necessarily the case? No. Being a doctor or a mechanic is, is not just about knowing the right terms, is it? 
There's a lot more to it than just knowing the parts or, or the treatments. It takes a lot more than that. And the same is true of our faith. Simply knowing and using biblical terminology doesn't make a person a believer. It's more than just knowing the right words. Listen again to the first few verses of our passage. How many religious terms do you see Nebuchadnezzar using in just these first three verses? Nebuchadnezzar, the king, to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are His signs and how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and His dominion is from generation to generation. Now, truth be told, anyone can use those words, right? Anyone can read those words. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be a believer of any sort to just give voice to those words or to write them down. You know, there are another of other faith systems in our world. Some have absolutely no connection to the Bible at all. Others have a connection, but it's kind of like a, a a Bible or, or Christ plus something else. Maybe they have some additional literature or maybe they, they reinterpret certain things to fit their ideals. But some of these faiths will use the same sort of terminology that biblical Christianity uses. But they mean something different by it. There are other faiths that may talk about something like salvation for instance. But when you dig into it, well, what does it mean to be saved or what does it take to be saved? After you get past what are we being saved from, what you find is that it's, it's not simply by faith in Christ. You may have to work a little bit to get it. You may have to do certain things to show that you're worthy of God's attention, or to maintain the salvation that He's offered. It's not enough that, that He gave it to you. You have to somehow work to hang on to it. Some of these faiths may even talk about Jesus. But when you look kind of behind the scenes, what you find is that they, they believe that there was a guy named Jesus. They might even believe He was a, a prophet or, or that He was like God, but he wasn't really God. God-like. Some might even say, well, he, he's kind of like the angels. He's, he's basically a brother of Satan. Friends, you won't find anything in the Bible to support that at all. It's just absolutely not true according to the Bible. And yet we find ourselves using these same words but when we're using the same words with different meanings or different understandings, we can end up talking past each other and think, oh, I guess we're all on the same page. But we're not, because it's just words. Let me step off to the side here for a moment and, and throw out one more thing about using religious language. Your prayers don't have to use stained glass words. I think sometimes we, we listen to other people pray, and I think, unfortunately, it can happen, especially in a church setting. We listen to the, the people that maybe pray before, during, or after a service, or, or in our small groups, we listen to a leader pray, and we think, wow, that person really prays nice. You know, they, they seem to use really good words it, it's not about the words. When we pray, we are entering into a conversation with our Heavenly Father. And, and somehow, we can be deceived into thinking, I need to sprinkle some these and, and thous and thys into my prayers so that they, they sound more churchy. No, you don't. God wants to hear what's on your heart. I mean, He already knows it, but He just... He just wants you to talk to Him the way you talk. 
And so let me, let me just offer as kind of a, an encouragement and a reminder, when we pray together, whether it's, it's here in the church service or, or even and especially in our, our growth groups, when, when we pray together as a group, okay, one, you're not there to evaluate anyone else's prayer, okay? You're not there to mentally kind of score and, and say, ah, that wasn't a very good prayer. That's not your job. That person is talking to their heavenly Father, not you. You just got to listen. And by the same token, then, remember that that's what I told everybody else, so you don't need to worry about them doing it now. Just pray. Just tell God what's on your heart. You don't have to use certain words for God to be willing to hear your prayer. Yeah, true believers will often use religious-sounding language. It kind of just comes with the territory. Those are the things the Bible talks about. We talk about those things. But simply using religious language does not a believer make. Let's move into the second thing we find in our text. Experiencing a miracle does not a believer make. Nebuchadnezzar here praises God for what the Lord had done for him personally. Look at verse 2 again. It seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me, he says. All right, well, so what has God done for Nebuchadnezzar so far? Well, right from the start of it all, though the king probably didn't realize it himself, if we went all the way back to the opening two verses of the book of Daniel, we see that God was the one who gave Israel into his hand. When Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon came against Israel and Jerusalem, God gave the nation into King Nebuchadnezzar's hand. So it was God who allowed Nebuchadnezzar to conquer and subject Israel. In Daniel chapter 2, God gave Israel. Daniel, the details of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had had, which he wouldn't tell anybody about. No, you tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me what it means. God gave Daniel the details and gave him the interpretation. That was something no other wise man in the entire kingdom of Babylon could do. And Nebuchadnezzar learned in that moment that the God of the Hebrews was all wise, that this God could reveal mysteries that no other God could make known. In Daniel 3, we saw that God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. And that showed the king that God had the power to override the will of earth's mightiest rulers, which in that time, Nebuchadnezzar was pretty much at the top of the heap. What he said was what happened. If he said, you're dead, you're dead. And what he found was God had the power to override that. God had the power to deliver his servants from death. Here in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar was now at ease and flourishing. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. He was content. He was secure. He was experiencing peace and prosperity on every front. It would seem that by this point in his reign, his enemies had been subdued. There was no lingering serious threat to his authority. So, it probably seemed to Nebuchadnezzar that he was hashtag blessed, right? You know, hey, everything's going great. I was just relaxing in my palace. There wasn't anything that was bothering me. You know, I think a lot of people experience God's provision, blessing, maybe even God's miraculous delivery at times. Christians and non-Christians alike. For instance, a non-believer might escape serious harm from a, a severe accident, or, or they might find themselves living very comfortably with plenty of money in reserve, and, and maybe everything they do is going their way. And they might kind of sit back at ease 
flourishing in their palace and think to themselves, you know what, I think God must be okay with me because I'm doing great. They are experiencing what they might perceive to be God's blessing. I would say more likely, God is trying to get their attention. Helping them to realize that He's there, that He desires a relationship with them, that He wants them to be saved from the impending consequences of their sin. You know, God does do some pretty miraculous things sometimes, doesn't He? Things that sometimes we just can't explain. I don't know how that car could be so demolished and that person not only survived, but they really were relatively uninjured. That, that's like a, a borderline miracle, right? God does do things like that in the lives of, of unbelievers. He may do miracles in the lives of believers so that unbelievers can witness it and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. How did that happen? Friends, it's not enough to just witness a miracle of God. What matters is, what do we do with that experience? Do we allow that to make us kind of question what we believe? Do we allow that to maybe change our thoughts, our opinions, our beliefs about who's behind it all? Does it l drive us to faith in God, or do we just chalk it up to another amazing occurrence? You look through the pages of your Bible, you will find so many miraculous things that God does throughout the pages of Scripture. Some resulted in people believing in Him. Others just flat out rejected what they saw. If we were to go back to the second book of the Old Testament there, the book of Exodus, we, we find Pharaoh, ruler of Egypt, has, has Israel, the, the God's chosen people, they are in captivity, and God performed ten mighty miraculous things through Moses and Aaron. He brought these plagues on the nation of Egypt in order to convince the Egyptian monarch to let the Israelites go. But what we read is that Pharaoh hardened his heart. He just refused. He saw all of these things, and maybe initially they, they weren't so spectacular that his own magicians couldn't, you know, come up with something that looked kind of similar. But as they progressed... His guys were like, I got nothing. I, I, I don't know how that happened and I can't do anything like it. And yet he still said, nope, nope, I won't. I refuse to believe. doesn't matter what I see, I'm not going to believe. It's not just about what we witness. Because experiencing a miracle does not a believer make. The third point that comes out of what we just saw here is that being impressed by God and his actions does not a believer make. Nebuchadnezzar was always impressed by God and, and impressed by what God did. He, he talks of his great signs and his mighty wonders. Look again, verses 2 and 3, he says, It seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are His signs, how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Now, of course, as we've seen, this isn't the first time that Nebuchadnezzar has had good things to say about God, is it? Look back at the end of the previous two chapters. Look back to chapter 2. Verses 46 and 47, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present him an offering and fragrant incense. In verse 47, the king answered Daniel and said, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. And look then at, towards the end of Daniel chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. Here again, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. So he has some good things to say about God, and he's doing it again here. Beginning of chapter 4, he'll conclude chapter 4 much the same way. Something we need to understand about chapter 4, what we're reading about here, and as we make our way through this and we hear about Nebuchadnezzar's next dream and a a seven-year period of insanity that he went through before being restored to sanity, all of that took place before chapter 4 was written. So those things had happened, and Nebuchadnezzar is is basically kind of handing out a, a summary here. Hey, I need to tell you what happened. These things had already taken place. Nebuchadnezzar had already been humbled. He acknowledged God's sovereignty. He gave him praise. The end of verse 3 in Daniel 4 here, where he talks about God's kingdom being an everlasting kingdom, his dominion being from generation to generation, he quotes it almost exactly the same way at the second half of verse 34 later in this chapter. And both of those are almost a direct quote of Psalm 145, verse 13, which, I don't know, maybe the king heard that from Daniel and decided, yeah, that that sums it up real well. Whatever the case, Nebuchadnezzar was impressed. He had seen God do amazing things, giving Daniel the dream and its interpretation in chapter 2, rescuing Daniel's friends in chapter 3, what will come here in chapter 4 when God humbles Nebuchadnezzar and then sees him restored. Nebuchadnezzar was impressed. But that by itself is not enough to make a person a believer. There's, there is, though, something we should take from Nebuchadnezzar's example here. In verse 2, he, he starts it off saying, it seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders. It seemed good to me to tell you what the Most High God has done for me. You know, friends, I, I think that should be the attitude of any believer, every believer, that it, it should... It should seem good to us to tell others what God has done for us. We shouldn't be shy about that. If God's done something wonderful, we should be pleased to share that experience with others. Go ahead. Let people know what God has done for you, how God has provided for you, how God has encouraged you, how God saw you through that difficult stretch in your life, in your marriage. Let others know what God has done for you. Go ahead and let them know that you are impressed by God's actions. We should be. God is amazing. That's right, and that is good. But again, by itself, being impressed by God and His actions does not a believer make. There's one more thing that Nebuchadnezzar shows us here. Knowing true believers does not a believer make. Nebuchadnezzar shows he still hasn't really gotten it, Look to the last two verses of our passage, verses 8 and 9. Finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen along with its interpretation." You notice that Nebuchadnezzar still is referring to Daniel by his Babylonian name, which connects him to the king's pagan god. Now, Nebuchadnezzar truly believed that Daniel had direct access to his god, the god of the Hebrews. He believed that Daniel's god was the most high god, a god above all other gods. He had seen Daniel do what no one else could do, And that was because God had enabled him to do it. But as he says here twice, he believed it was because the spirit of the holy gods was in him. It still seems that Daniel's God was in Nebuchadnezzar's mind just one of many. Granted, he got top billing. He was the the most high God, but he was still just one of many a pantheon of of a number of gods. He was just the best of what was out there. It really doesn't seem like Nebuchadnezzar had changed at heart. We see all the experiences 
that he had had that they didn't really keep him from trying the, the same approach to his problem as in the past. Look at verses 4 through 7 in the middle there. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house, flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream, and it made me fearful in these fantasies as I lay on my bed, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. So, here he goes right back to what he did in chapter 2. So, I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. So, it goes right back to doing things the way he's always done things. I don't know, let's bring in the smart guys, see what they have to say. Daniel came in last. We don't really know why. Maybe, maybe he wasn't available initially when the rest of them were called. Uh, maybe as the, the leader of the wise men, the chief of them all, maybe Daniel only considered matters that the other guys fell short on. That's a good side note to grasp as well. We need to realize this takes place like some 30 years after the events of chapter 2 where Daniel gave the king the, the details and interpretation of that first dream that we saw in chapter 2. This is like three decades later here. And we see that Daniel was still the chief of the king's counselors, so he must have performed his duties admirably because he's still in charge. That's great. The king knows someone who knows God. But that's not enough. Same is true today. It's, it's not enough. Knowing other Christians doesn't make a person a Christian. It concerns me to see so many people who think that growing up in a Christian family or, or being a, a regular church attender, that that's enough to save them, to make them okay in God's eyes. Because I, I want to be able to grab every one of those people and say, okay, so what are, you going to, what are you going to say when you face God at the end of this life and he essentially says to you, why should I let you into heaven? What are you going to say? Uh, well, uh, you know, my, my grandmother was a Christian. Uh, my, my folks were Christians. They, they made me go to church when I was a kid. Uh, are you going to say, hey, I'm, I'm directly related to them, so I was kind of just hoping in, you know, trickle-down theory that, you know, genetically maybe I'm a, a Christian because, you know, I was born to Christian parents. Hey, I've gone to, I've gone to church before. Uh, sometimes, you know, Christmas, most of the time, well, Easter, I guess, most of the time, Christmas sometimes. You know, I, I've been to church, or maybe, you know, I, I go to church every time the doors are open. I'm always in the church, because, you know, church is good, and if you're in church, that makes you good. That should make me okay in God's eyes. Hanging out with Christian people doesn't make you a Christian. Not even if your family members are, are Christians. It's, it's no different than standing in, in a garage and thinking you're a car. You're not a car because you're standing in a garage. You're not a Christian because you're sitting in a church. Knowing true believers does not a believer make. So what's it come down to then? What makes a believer? You ready? The answer is really simple, but we'll explore it a little bit as we wrap up. You're going to think this sounds like circular reasoning here, but we're going to explain it. So here, here it is. A true believer is one who truly believes. Really simple. A true believer is one who truly believes. That's the simplest definition of a believer, one who believes. But then we have to say, okay, who, who believes what? What do you have to believe to be a true believer? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run us through a handful of familiar verses, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to ask you to turn to them. I'll give you the, here's where you find it. You can scribble that down real quick, and I will read the verses for us so that you can hear them, and you can, you can look them up again later. But I'm going to bounce this around just a couple of different books of the Bible that give us an answer to that question, what do we need to believe? What makes a believer? I'm going to be going kind of quick here, but I'll give you the reference. So, uh, here it is. A true believer is one who truly believes. First one I would point you toward is Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Hebrews 11:6, 6, which says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, that is God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. 
Hebrews 11.6. We must believe that God is, that He exists. We must believe that He is who He shows Himself to be in Scripture. He wants us to respond in faith, understanding that He will grant us forgiveness of sin and salvation from its consequences through faith in Christ. It is impossible to please God without believing in Him, without having faith in Him. So, that's the first one. Second, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it is God's grace which is behind His offer of salvation. We receive that gracious offer, that gift, we receive it by faith, believing. It's faith alone. We can't work for it. We can't do enough good. We can't avoid enough bad to earn salvation. It is God's gracious gift to us that we receive by faith. And by definition, a gift can't be paid for because now it's not a gift anymore. It is a free gift. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever, what, believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. God, in His grace and mercy, sent His own Son to take the punishment for our sins, my sins, your sins, to take that on Himself. And Jesus did that willingly. He died on that cross. He was raised to life again and thereby defeated both sin and death. And that is why He could say in His last words from the cross, it is finished. We believe in Jesus as the Son of God, believing what He accomplished for us on the cross, we will receive God's forgiveness and salvation. We won't perish in eternal torment in hell, but we will receive eternal life in God's presence. Believe. Let me, let me give us one last one here. John chapter 1 verse 12. John 1, 12, to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to be called, to become children of God. It is by faith, by believing in Christ, that we enter into an eternal relationship with God. We are offered the opportunity to become God's children. And that, that right there, that is what I want us to take away from our time together this morning. Genuine belief is rooted in a relationship. Genuine belief is rooted in a relationship. It's not about anything else. A, a true believer is one who truly believes. Do you believe? Friends, eternity is in our future. We will live forever beyond this earthly life, and it will only be in one of two places, heaven or hell. Your ultimate destination will be determined by what you decide to believe in this life. A true believer is not someone who uses religious language, experiences a miracle, is impressed by God and His actions, or just knows other people who are true believers. You must know Christ. A true believer is someone who truly believes. You must accept that relationship with God by faith in His Son. Genuine belief is rooted in a relationship. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I think I would not be doing us any favors if I didn't say that right now, today, if, if you have not yet believed 
in Jesus, I'm going to invite you to do that today, right now, right where you sit with your eyes closed and your head bowed. God knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart, and accepting His free gift is as simple as ABC. A, admit that you are a sinner. Admit it. Agree with God in prayer. He knows it. You know it. You've done things that you know are wrong. God knows it. Admit it. B, believe. Believe in Jesus. He is God. He loves you. He died for you. He rose again. He's praying for you right now. Believe it. C, confess. Confess your faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. In Romans 10, we read that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And a couple of verses later it says, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So let me invite us to just take a quiet moment here that we can pray in the quietness of our own hearts and seek the Lord together. If you are ready to ask God to forgive you and to accept His gracious gift, do it now. God, thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for loving us enough to offer us forgiveness and salvation. Thank you for offering a relationship with you by faith in your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us, and let's close out our time together with a very, very simple chorus declaring, I believe in Jesus. true. God has the grace and the willingness to forgive everyone who would come to Him by faith, believing in His Son, Jesus Christ. 
I'm going to invite my deacons to join me at the front, and uh, as we're dismissed, if, if you prayed to put your faith in Christ this morning, come talk to us. I would, I would love to rejoice together with you. If you felt that this morning was a time where you just needed to recommit your, your life to Christ, come talk to us and let me encourage you in that. If you have questions about walking through life with Christ, come talk to us. If you just need somebody to pray with you about something that's going on in your life right now, come pray with us. Go in God's grace and be assured of His love for you. Amen.